All right, so what I want to do today is I want to go back and finish applications of Markov's inequality, Chebyshev's inequality, and talk about how we can use these, how we can derive them, and why Chebyshev does such a better job than Markov, and why other things will do a better job than Chebyshev. So can somebody briefly tell me what is the input we need for Markov's inequality? Yes? We need the mean, and that's all we need. Or do we need anything else in addition to the mean? Well, we're, we're trying to bound a probability. What do we need about the random variable? We need to know its mean, and what else do we need to know about the random variable? It's not negative. It's not negative. So those are the two inputs. We then showed how Chebyshev is able to you know, follow immediately for Markov. I'm going to prove Chebyshev directly. As you look at this proof, try to remember the proof of Markov, and you will see that it's almost identical to the proof of Markov, just applying it to uh, a slightly different random variable calculation. Okay. That's why the proof of just substituting in the random variable y equals x minus mu squared in Markov is essentially what I'm doing. So Chebyshev. So x has mean mu, which is less than infinity, variance sigma squared less than infinity. Then the probability that x is greater than equal, so that x minus mu is greater than or equal to k sigma is less than or equal to 1 over k squared. This is a terrific thing to study. You want to see how far away are you from the mean. If the mean is in meters, then my distance from the mean should be in meters. So I expect it to be in units of sigma. And then a great, you know, so sigma is just a natural scale to use to study the size of the fluctuations. How many standard deviations away am I? The proof is actually not too bad. So the probability that x minus mu is greater than or equal to k sigma, well, by definition, this is just the integral over all x such that x minus mu is greater than or equal to k sigma of the density. This is true by definition. <coughs> now, what was the key? step we did? What was the key trick we did in proving Markov? The expected value of x over a. The expected value of x over a. And we got that by multiplying by not quite 1, but by something that was always at least 1, and we got an upper bound. So we're going to do the same thing here, and we're going to get an upper bound. So instead of multiplying by 1, I want to multiply by something that's always going to be greater than or equal to 1. What would be a terrific quantity that would be greater than or equal to 1? Yes? The absolute value of x minus mu over k sigma? Almost. Oh, square, square it. So we want to integrate now over all x such that x minus mu is greater than or equal to k sigma. And what we're going to do is we're going to put in x minus mu squared over k squared sigma squared fx of x dx. And the reason is, this is always going to be at least 1. Now, we extend the range of integration. So this is true for, and now if we just drop this constraint, we make the region of integration larger, so we can't decrease the probability. If you look at what's going on here, could this ratio be less than 1 if x minus mu is not greater than k sigma? Absolutely, but we're just adding that probability. So we're still going to have an inequality. So this would be less than or equal to, and we pull out the 1 over k squared sigma squared, integral x goes from minus infinity to infinity of x minus mu squared fx of x dx. Well, what does that integral equal? What's the integral of x minus mu squared f of x? Yes, sigma squared. So we have a sigma squared divided by 1 over k squared sigma squared. So we get just 1 over k squared. And that's the proof. Okay. So the proof just follows from taking the definition of what it means to be the probability that you're at least k sigma away from the mean. 
multiplying by a quantity that's greater than or equal to 1 in that regime, extending the range of integration, and then noticing, ah, that that's the integral you know, that we know. All right, let's apply, yes? I don't actually, why do you multiply it by a quantity that has to be greater than or equal to 1? Yeah. I don't want to decrease the integration. I want to get an upper bound. So if I'm going to get an upper bound, I have to multiply it by something that's greater than or equal to 1. That's legal. If I multiplied by something that was less than 1, I could have decreased this, and this would no longer be an upper bound for the probability. We're trying to come up with an upper bound for the probability of these unlikely events. We're trying to calculate what's the likelihood that we're going to be at least k sigma away from the mean. Well, this is the probability that we're at least k sigma over the mean. This will be an upper bound for that. And the reason this is a good upper bound to use is that we're getting an x minus mu squared times the density. That looks a lot like the variance. We know something about the variance of the distribution. So that at the end of the day, the algebra will cancel beautifully and give us a nice bound. So that's why we want to multiply by something here. Because this is at least 1, this inequality holds and everything is going in the right direction. We then extend the region of integration. We can do that. That's not going to cost us anything. Okay. Now that we have uh, Markov, now that we have Chebyshev, what should we be asking? So let's say I have a non-negative random variable and I want to estimate a probability. What should I ask? How close yeah, how close are they? Which do you think does a better job, Markov or Chebyshev? Probably Chebyshev. Why do you think Chebyshev does a better job? Yeah, it uses more information. One would hope that the more work you do and the more you know, the better job you do. This is not always the case in life. There are red herrings and you can get confused. But as a rule of thumb, you would hope that the more information we're using about the distribution, the better result we can get. Let's take a nice non-negative random variable. Let's take a continuous one so I can do integration. Can anybody give me a good continuous uh, random variable that is supported from 0 to infinity? What's a good one to use? OK, but then I would have to be integrating the normals to see how accurate things are. Exponential. OK, so let's try as an example. Let's say x is exponential with parameter 1. So this means the density is equal to e to the negative x for x greater than or equal to 0. One of the problems with the normal is that it's not non-negative. And so we wanted to try to use Markov. That wouldn't work. We could take the absolute value of the normal and apply Markov to that. But it's going to be a little bit easier to just take the exponential as our example. So let's calculate the probability that x is greater than or equal to 4. The mean equals 1. The standard deviation equals 1. Okay. So what would be the probability that x is greater than or equal to 4? What integral would that be? OK, so the integral from 4 to infinity of e to the minus x dx. So this becomes e to the negative 4. And I had written down what e to the negative 4 was. Over here, I forgot to memorize it. It is 0 0.018, approximately. OK. Let's try Markov. we would get the probability that x is greater than or equal to 4. I want to interpret this in terms of the mean. So this would be the probability that x is greater than or equal to 4 times the mean. And so according to Markov, what would we get? A fourth. So this would be at most 1 fourth, or 0.25. It's at least consistent. It's off by an enormous amount, but it's consistent. All right, now let's try Chebyshev. Let's try the probability that x is greater than or equal to 4. How should I write this in terms of Chebyshev? Uh, 
I've got to figure out what k is. So how would I write this? This would be the probability. So well, x minus what? x minus 1, because the mean is 1. An absolute value is greater than or equal to greater than or equal to 3. This does also talk a little bit about maybe probabilities of x being negative. We know those probabilities are, neg uh, are 0. So according to Chebyshev, this is less than or equal to 1 over 9, or 0 0.11, approximately. Neither one does a great job. Chebyshev does do a better job than Markov, but neither one is particularly close. Why do you think neither one of them is doing a great job? OK, so we could, we could try bumping this up. Uh, do you want to bump up to 8? To like 1,000? To 1,000? Oh, jeez. How about 10? <laughs> All right. you, I mean, you, if you want to do 1,000. <sighs> All right. 1,000. <laughs> All right. We put in 1,000 here. Put in 1,000 here. Dear God. All right. And this is why you bring Mathematica to class. And so I will put in a thousand. Uh, Mathematica has a complete error in terms of not being able to calculate something like this. So we want one divided by exponential of a thousand. Um, I will. I'm going to have to try to give it some information about how many decimals to calculate. Okay. Ten. Uh, it's about five times ten to the negative four thirty-five. All right, so this is approximately 5 times 10 to the negative 435. All right, now we're using 1,000 here, OK? So what number comes over here? We want x to be greater than or equal to 1,000. That's going to be 1,000 times the mean. And so we get a upper bound of 1 over 1,000, or 0 0.001. It's so a little bit better here. What do we get over here now? <laughs> what number here? 999. So 999 squared, which is approximately 1,000. It's approximately that, right? It's approximately 1 over 1,000 squared. So it's not that we were just you know, too close to the mean. Yeah, let's go way down. Uh, these are not close to 10 to the negative 435. This is extremely overestimating the probability. What in a thousand? You know, I would not be so surprised to see an event whose probability is one in a thousand. To see something, you know, one over 10 to the 435. Uh, any hitchhiker guide fans here? This is at the level of the infinite improbability drive. You know, this is not something you would expect to see at all. Why do Chebyshev and Markov do such a bad job? Not enough information. Not enough information. They are trying to be applicable to too large of a class of distributions. The more distributions you try to understand at the same time, the less you can use. So fundamentally, you expect to have trouble. The trouble is when you have rapid decay. These have to work no matter what distribution we put in. We're not using anything about the shape of the distribution. And so I want to use this as a preliminary to lead us up into our conversations later when we get to the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem is going to work in enormous generality for input probability distributions. And the question is, why does it work so well? Why do we have this universality that doesn't seem to depend on the shape of the underlying distribution? OK. To just really drive home the point about how adding information helps, we all agree that at least in this case, Chebyshev is doing better than Markov. It's an interesting question, will Chebyshev always do better than Markov? So if you want you know, an extra credit problem, uh, try to prove you know, when Chebyshev will do better than Markov. <laughs> what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about Newton's method. versus divide and conquer.
How many of you have seen divide and conquer? This is very important in a lot of computer science applications. So let's assume uh, divide and conquer. We'll say f is continuous. And imagine here's 0, here's 1, f is positive here, and f is negative here. What can we deduce? There has to be a 0. Why must there be a 0? It's continuous. What theorem gives us that there must be a 0? Intermediate value theorem. Excellent. A lot of people can now email me, right? Intermediate value theorem, there has to be a 0. What point should we look at next? One half. Let's assume it's positive at one half. What do we know? There is at least one zero between one half and one. Could there be a zero between zero and one half? Yes. Okay. You've got to be very careful to only extract the right thing. There's the joke about the mathematician, the physicist, and the engineer on a train in Scotland. Have you heard this one? And they spy a black sheep in the countryside. And the engineer goes, oh, Scottish sheep are black. And the physicist goes, no, 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 no. All we can conclude is there exists at least one sheep in Scotland, which is black. And the mathematician goes, no, 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 no. All we can deduce is there is at least one sheep in Scotland, which is? Not white. Nope. Black on one side. <laughs> Be very careful what you extract from a situation. Do we have any information about what's going on from zero to a half? No. Be very careful to say, we know there must be a zero between one half and one. We will say nothing about this region. What do we do now? I'm sorry? Three quarters. Three quarters. And if that was negative, we keep chopping in half. OK, so divide at midpoint. Then lather, rinse, repeat. So every 10 iterations, the error decreases by how much? So if we do this 10 times, how much does the error decrease by? 2 to the 10th, or 1 over 2 to the 10. And 1 over 2 to the 10 is approximately a thousand. So two to the tenth is ten twenty-four. There's one thousand twenty-four megabytes in a gigabyte. Where are my computer scientists? Okay. <laughs> Do the computer scientists just not understand ancient languages? Why do the computer scientists misuse the words mega and giga? Advertising? No. I'm sorry? <laughs> like to make certain like chips and things sound better, so it's like certain words. It's powers of two. Computers work base two. Computers work base two. Right? That's the reason they do it. And you know, it's approximately the same, it's almost the same, it's off by about two percent, it's not a huge deal. But every time we go through ten iterations, we decrease our error by a factor of a thousand. What that means is, if you want to try to calculate, say, the square root of 3, every 10 iterations will give you three more digits. <coughs> so if you want to get, say, six digits accuracy, you might have to do this 20 times. So I could look at the function f of x equals x squared minus 3. And if I look at this function, where is this function equal to 0? plus or minus square root of 3. And so I can keep trying values of square root of, you know, for x and see is my function positive or negative, <laughs> and I can keep doing the divide and conquer. And every 10 steps, I will gain three digits of accuracy of square root of 3. This is not going to be fun, OK? I want to show you divide and conquer. And to me, this is the, you know, the best way to really illustrate the differences between Markov and Chebyshev to prelude into the central limit theorem. So we'll erase the calculation. <laughs> OK. So Newton's method. <coughs> this is also a good way to review a lot of the calculus you've done, to see some applications of the calculus you've done. 
So let's take the function f of x is x squared minus 3. And let's guess that the square root of 3 is about what? I need a nice guess. No. That's not an easy number to work with. No. No. One is a bad guess. Two. I'll guess the square root of 3 is 2. All right. I want you to all agree that this is not a very good guess. I'm trying to stack the numbers to make the algebra easier and not have an easy, I'm going to have an easier time with the calculation than having a really accurate first guess and using much information. You know, 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 4 is closer than 3. I'm going to go with 2 as my guess. So this is how Newton's method works. So let's say you have a function f of x. And you have a point. So here's my point x0, which is 2. Then this is the point x0, f of x0, also known as the point 2. And what's f of 2? 1. So in calculus, what do you learn does a really good job of approximating the function, at least locally? The tangent line. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw the tangent line. And we're going to say the tangent line is our function for all eternity. Is this a reasonable assumption? Is a quadratic the same as a line? No. This, this approximation cannot work forever. But in small neighborhoods, it should be pretty good. And what we can do is we can flow down the tangent line and see where this hits the x-axis. And that will be an approximation to the 0. The slope of this is m is f prime at x0. Well, the derivative is just 2x, so this will be 2x0, so the derivative is 4. And so we get that the tangent line is y minus f of x0 equals f prime of x0, x minus x0. So we get y minus 1 is 4x minus x0. So y is 4x minus x0 plus 1. How do we find the place where it crosses the x-axis? Well, y equals 0. And so 0 will be 4x1 minus x0 plus 1. We'll call that interception x1. And we get... Um, Right. Yeah, okay. And so now we get, uh, we move this over, we get 4x0 on the other side, 4x0 plus 1 equals 4x1. Uh, x1 is 4, I'm oh, sorry, this is a minus 1. 4x0 minus 1 over 4, or 7 fourths. And then it's lather, rinse, repeat. And now what we do is we come up here, and now we draw the tangent line approximation. And hopefully you're convinced with just even two approximations, it's pretty good. You can just keep going through this. You can actually get a specific formula for the n plus first term in terms of the nth term. As a nice exercise, go through that. I'll list a couple of the uh, answers. All right, let's use this. Let's see, let's see, uh, let's make sure it's, uh, thank you. All right, so the next one, so this is the square root of 3. So our first approximation is 7 fourths. I don't really need to look up 7 fourths. What's 7 fourths? 1.75. Not bad. If you go through the next level, you get 97 over 56. And what's nice is these are always going to be rational numbers. 97 over 56 is 1.73214 dot dot dot. Not so bad. The next one is 18,817 over 10,864. That's going to be 1.73205. 08100. Not bad. If you do one more, blah is going to be 
1.7320508075688771979. So the, the two sevens are agreeing and instead of two, we have a one. Basically, every time you apply Newton's method, you double the digits. Double number of digits each iteration. There's a reason Newton was Newton. You know, there's a reason we hold him up as one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. This is absolutely phenomenal. With just a little bit of work, look at how many digits of accuracy we're getting. This might overflow a lot of your calculators. In the era of smartphones, no. Why does Newton's method destroy divide and conquer? Why is Newton's method so much better? Yes? So this unit, if it knows something about the lines, it's not using it? Okay, so what are we using? We're using the derivative. We're using calculus. This is why Newton's method is able to do so much more than divide and conquer, because we're using more information. We now have all the tools of calculus, all the tools of differentiability at our disposal. There's a huge theory involving Newton's method. This leads to fractal geometry. You know, when does this converge? In fact, there will be situations where it will not converge to roots. Uh, there will be very fractal situations where if you disturb yourself ever so slightly, you can change which route you go to in an arbitrarily small neighborhood. There's a lot of great math behind this. I wanted to just talk about this because it's a great way to review what's going on, and it's a great way to see applications of calculus. And it highlights the general theme which has been going on right now. The more you know, the more you should be able to conclude. But there's a problem. Why might divide and conquer be better than Newton's method? I'm sorry? So there is some stability issues with Newton's method, and that is definitely an advantage of divide and conquer. Why else might divide and conquer be better? Be a little bit stronger than you don't want to take the derivative. Yeah, what if your function is not differentiable? You might want to take the derivative, but if the derivative does not exist, you can't use Newton's method. So divide and conquer is applicable in more cases than Newton's method. Does this seem a lot like Markov now in Chebyshev? So Markov is applicable in more cases than Chebyshev. So when you don't have as much information, use Markov. When you have more information, use Chebyshev. And that's what's going on here. Okay, any questions on this? Uh, what I want to do now is I want to go into Stirling's formula. And so we basically seem to be in a calculus review day, you know, applications of calculus. The first time I taught probability, I was, you know, going from Ohio State where I was a postdoc to Brown where I was going to be a postdoc. And I was told what book I was going to use. And I went to the library at Ohio State. This was back when you go to libraries to get things. And I picked up a copy of the book. And I was careless. I just picked up you know, the first book I saw with the correct title. And there was one point where they were doing a problem on like Poisson random variables or something like that. And the answer was a binomial coefficient. And I still remember the book wrote, you may think you've solved the problem, but you haven't. I'm going, no, I've solved the problem. This is the answer. And then the next line is, we now have to calculate this binomial coefficient. What is it? Uh, the edition I had of the book was so old, this was before the prevalence of calculators that could handle large factorials. And they talk about how you can now approximate the ratio of these large factorials and estimate what the answer should be. A lot of this now we don't have to worry about. We have wonderful devices that do all this stuff for us. But we want to know how quickly do things grow. You've seen this with L'Hopital's method. If you have ratios of you know, 0 over 0, infinity over infinity, and we want to figure out which one's growing faster. You know, we have ways to handle that. Stirling's formula is extremely important in probability. It allows us to estimate n factorial. So it says n factorial is approximately n to the n e to the minus n square root of 2 pi n 1 minus, I think, 1 over 12n plus dot, 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 dot. Okay. 
there are a lot of different ways to prove Stirling's formula. What function do you think might be useful for Stirling's formula? Yeah, the gamma function. And in fact, the square root of 2 pi should almost be a hint that maybe there's a gamma function lurking here. Why is the gamma function useful? The gamma function is a continuous function. We can apply tools of analysis to the gamma function. And so one way to prove this is through analysis and the gamma function. What I want to do is, rather than giving a full proof of this, I will show you how you can analyze this and get some things that are reasonably close, show you how you can attack problems like this and get a sense of order of magnitude. There is a really nice backdoor proof of this using the central limit theorem. And so when we prove the central limit theorem, this is actually a consequence of the central limit theorem. Now the problem, of course, is we're not going to fully prove the central limit theorem in this class. But I will fully prove the central limit theorem in my complex analysis class. So if you want to just watch those videos, um, you'll also have to watch, I think, all the real analysis videos first and all the up to that semester. But it will reduce Stirling's formula to something that should seem very reasonable after this class. Okay? So the first thing is we have, let's study n factorial. So what's the first thing you should be thinking of when you see n factorial? I've got to start bringing my bell to class. What should you be thinking? Product. And as soon as you hear the word product, you should be salivating. Logs. Right? Whenever you see a product, you should be thinking logarithms. Why? We know sums. We can deal with sums. We love sums, relatively speaking to other things that we could do in a math class. Okay? When you see a product, you want to think logs. So think log to make a sum. Now this is going to be really nice. The log of n factorial, the log of a product is the sum of the logs. It's the log of 1 plus the log of 2 plus the log of n. This is going to be the sum. k goes from 1 to n of the log of k. What does that look like? Anybody notice what this looks like? So we've got a sum of log of k. k goes from 1 to n. I'm sorry? The prize um, not quite the prize problem. But I'm saying, yes. Like it looks like an integral, right? Is it an integral? No. But you remember the integral test from calculus. If you have a function that's either monotonically increasing or monotonically decreasing, you can approximate the sum with an integral, and you'll be off basically by either the first term or the last term. So we get the log of n factorial is the sum k goes from 1 to n of the log of k. This is going to be approximately the integral from 1 to n of the log of t dt. I could do a lot better job and be more careful and go through the integral test. I'm assuming you do not want to see me be that careful and go through all the details with the integral test and worry about how we should bound things. I'll just quickly say how you would do it and not spend that much time on it. So, you know, here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, n. And so, you know, the first one is I have the log of 1, which is 0. Then maybe the log of 2, log of 3, log of 4, like this. And now if I draw the function log of t, uh, I've got to be a little bit careful, but if I start at here, the log of 1 is 0. So if I draw a log of t, this is going to be over, the sum is going to be over that. 
And so if I integrate log of t from 1 to n minus 1, that will be a lower bound. And then if I shift things and if I integrate from like 1 to n, um, I'll get an upper bound. I'm not going to really worry too much about that last term. Okay? But does everybody roughly agree that this should be a reasonable approximation? And my error should be about that last term. So the error is about <coughs> log of n from the last term. A little bit better is the error is going to be related to half of the first term and the last term. The error is going to be a pro on the order of a half log n. This is just doing a little bit better job with the integral test. What's the half of log of n? Nope. Log of the square root of n. When you exponentiate, one half log of n is going to exponentiate to a square root of n. If you're a little bit more careful, that's how you're going to get the square root of n. From doing a better job of figuring out what is my error when I replace the sum with the integral. The better job I do bounding my error, the better estimate I'm going to get. I need a function whose derivative is log t. Anybody know a function whose derivative is log t? Yes, how do you get that? <coughs> so method of divine inspiration. Right? You write down the answer, and then you notice that it's correct. This is my favorite way of proving things. What is the problem with the method of divine inspiration? You need to be divinely inspired. This does not always happen, especially on exams. Okay? What you can do is you can try to guess the solution and then vary your guess. I want to have a log t. Well, it makes sense that I want to start maybe with a log t in my function. If I take a t in front of it, when I take the derivative using the product rule, I'll get a 1 times log t plus t 1 over t. And now we can see it almost has derivative log t. It's log t plus 1. I'm a little bit off. I have to subtract 1. Right. Well, what function has derivative 1? t. Well, that's at least the simplest function that has derivative 1. So that would give me t log t minus t. I'm sorry? Um, OK, so you would say let u equal log t? And v is 1. And that, that, yes, that would work as well. You could do it by integration by parts. So you could integrate by parts. You could guess and refine. You could then try to figure out, can you find a nice formula for log squared of t or log cubed of t? So if you want for extra credit, you know, give me a nice formula for log to the nt. Is there a nice way to get that, maybe in terms of some polynomial involving logarithms? So the end result of all this is that at the end of the day, we get that this should be t log t minus t, and we evaluate this at t equals 1 and n. So we get n log n minus n, and what's the other bit we get? Then we have to subtract off when t equals 1, which is just going to be negative 1. So we get the log of n factorial is approximately n log n minus n plus 1. And we have an error of size maybe 1 half log n. Well, all we do now is we exponentiate, and we get n factorial is approximately e to the n log n minus n plus 1 with an error of size e to the 1 half log n. So we'll have some kind of factor on here. So roughly, this would be times a factor between 1 and e to the 1 half log n. So now, what, let's write e n log n minus n plus 1 in a better way. So how would you write e to the n log n minus n? So 
So we have n to the n, e to the minus n, and then the plus 1 will give us an e. And then we'll have times uh, a factor between 1 and square root of n. So in terms of trying to get a sense of the size of n factorial, we're doing a pretty good job. We're getting n to the n, e to the minus n. We actually believe that there should be a correction of size on the order of square root of n. We're not quite sure what that constant is. But this gives us a pretty good rough sense. So this is not a proof of Stirling, but this is at least a proof that Stirling's formula is reasonable. And this is extremely useful in terms of trying to understand the size of the uh, rate of growth of n factorial. <laughs> Okay, any questions about this? Yes? So does that then say kind of that n to the n is an ex of exponential order greater growth than n factorial? Yes. And if you want to look at the difference, you know, n factorial is you have n people and you order them where order matters. n to the n is you have n people and you choose with replacement n times. So this gives you an idea of how much more rapidly the number of combinations of ways to choose n people with replacement grows from the number of ways to choose n people where order matters and there is no replacement. You can you know, see similar things in the stuff we did earlier this week on trying to calculate the volume or the surface area of the n-dimensional sphere. We related these to gamma functions and you can figure out you know, rates of growth. Okay, so this is a sketch of the proof of Stirling's formula. You could make it more accurate if you had a more accurate formula for the integral test. We need a better control of the error term. And a better control of the error term gives you a much better uh, control over here. But you can see we're not off by that much. We're off by basically the square root of 2 pi n. We've got the main term right when n is very large. The other thing is, in a lot of problems, what matters is not n factorial, but the log of n factorial. So if you want to look at the log of n factorial, well, according to Sterling, the log of n factorial is approximately n log n minus n plus the log of square root of 2 pi n, and then the log of this is going to be very small. So if you're trying to understand what's the size of the log of n factorial, we've got the main term, and we've even got the secondary term right. We're missing down here. OK. All right, so we've got about five minutes left. I thought what we would do for the last five minutes is talk about <laughs> elementary ways to try to get to Stirling's formula. We're not going to be able to prove Stirling's formula, but it's going to allow me to show you a very powerful technique for proofs and attacking problems. So there are sections in the book about these elementary approaches to Stirling. So elementary attacks to Stirling. So n factorial is 1, 2, 3 to n. Can somebody give me a lower bound? n. I was actually half expecting to get 0 or 1. Can somebody give me an upper bound? So we know it's clearly at most n to the n. And I'd say a better lower bound then n is actually 1. Better in that it's just easier to use. I'm just using the lowest of the n numbers, and I'm using the highest of the n numbers. We can refine this. And a wonderful technique called dyadic decomposition. What we're going to do is we're going to break this in half. 1 times 2 times 3, all the way up to n halves. n halves, n halves plus 1 dot, 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 n. In the interest of time, I'm always going to assume n is whatever power of 2 I need so that these things make sense or just interpret them appropriately. Let's try to get a better upper bound for this. OK, 
can somebody give me a better upper bound than n to the n? Yes. Yes, but I'm going to do it the other way. I'll do it n halves to the n halves, and then n to the n halves. Just use the largest number in this range every time, and the largest number in this range every time. If I wanted a lower bound, what would I do? Smallest. So I'm not going to do the lower bound in class. You can handle the lower bound analogously. I'm going to just concentrate on the upper bound. Oh, this is pretty good. We're going to be getting an n to the n from this. So this over here will be an n to the n. And now we'll have a 1 half to the n over 2. Or if you want, you can view this as n to the n square root of 2 to the negative n. I'm just taking the 1 half here and moving that in and taking a square root. Instead of having a square root of 2 to the n, what should I really have? According to Sterling, what should this number be? It should be e. So you can see in just two iterations, we're not so bad. And you know, we're now getting uh, n to the n square root of 2 to the negative n. What do you think we should do now? I'm sorry? Split, Split again. So now we'll get 1 to n fourths. OK? And so what we'll get now is we'll get less than or equal to n fourths to the n fourths uh, two, 2n over 4 to the n fourths. 3n over 4 to the n fourths, and then 4n over 4. Well, we're going to get an n to the n again. And now we'll have 4, the 2 cancels down to 2, so 16, uh, 32. So I think we get 3 over 32. And we have this to the 1 fourth to the n. Well, if we want to put this to the negative n, we flip the 32 over, right? And so we would now get this is equal to n to the n, 32 over 3 to the 1 fourth power to the negative n. All right, and so if we now take uh, 32 divided by 3 to the 1 fourth, we get 1.807. This is about 1.807. Square root of 2 is about 1.414. E is about 2.7. So the more times you do this, the better you'll get. And the question is, can you push this all the way? We've got about one minute left. I want to end with one other approach you could take to this that works even faster than this. Okay. So again, this idea of dividing in half and applying your bounds and then piecing those bounds together, this is a phenomenally useful idea in mathematics. This is really worth mastering. We can do a little bit better job. When you look over here, we are being exceptionally crude. right? We're taking everything in here and replacing it with its largest value. What we're going to do now is we're going to match things in pairs. Let's look at the first one. What's 1 times n? n. If I have two numbers with the same sum, the product is maximized when the two of them are the same. So the largest product is going to be the middle, n halves times n halves. So this whole thing here is going to be less than or equal to n halves times n halves. And how many pairs would we have? and over two pairs. And so that would give us uh, n to the n. And then we would have the square root of 1 fourth, which is just 2. So we'd have uh, 1 over 2 to the n, so we have 2 to the negative n. 
Notice how much better that is and how much faster that is. You know, we're using, you might remember the Farmer Brown problem from Calc 1. You know, Farmer Brown has a problem. He likes cows. He likes only rectangular pens. He wants to maximize the, the volume, I'm sorry, the area given a fixed amount of fence. And so if I have two numbers, x plus y, that have a fixed sum, the largest I can do is when the two of them are equal for their product. And so I have roughly n over two pairs. The biggest product is going to be is at the middle. So I can bound this in the following way. You can then apply this in each of those subintervals and keep applying like that, and it's going to converge even faster. So this just gives you, you know, some sense of the different techniques we can use to attack problems like this. Okay, for Friday's class, if there's particular material you want me to cover, please